and they also used Helen Foley as the character in Twilight Zone the movie. So Helen Foley and a group of Rod's former students got together and formed uh, what became uh, in January of 87 the Rod Serling Memorial Foundation. And I spent six months and got them a non-for-profit status and I was a curator, archivist, and historian for seven years. Then as my health waned and the Serling family would no longer let even us borrow the, the prints and stuff to do film festivals, we had done three. And they were very, we had 800 the first night, uh, first festival in 87, and uh, we repeated it three times. And uh, then they would no longer let us have access to any material. So I left the organization in 94, and when Michael Weinstein uh, bought this property and decided for the museum, he put word out for me to come in and see him. Well, I ignored him for a year. I didn't really want to get sucked back into the rigorous schedule of all this volunteer work, but I did go in and see him. He interviewed me on camera for four hours, three different occasions, and he says, you've got to help me build this up into a nice archive collection. And I'll put together in 10 years almost 3,000 items, a lot of wonderful documents, uh, letters. We have three original handwritten uh, letters from Rod Serling that he had sent to his teacher Helen Foley in the 50s and 60s. We have a nice variety of material in some 16 millimeter and DVD material that no other museum or uh, art any place in the world has. Uh, even the Paley Center in New York and LA, uh, UCLA does not have some of the things that we have, so we're very fortunate. And uh, we've had some wonderful people make some wonderful donations to the museum. We are a not-for-profit. Uh, matter of fact, for five years we were on a temporary status, but this past April we gained national status for, for life. And they can never be taken away. There's three or four activities going on in our museum every day. The Rod Serling has always been free and always will be. We have a nice exhibit. We rotate the material every six months. And uh, it, every, all these in the zone programs, I've done over 37 of them at the museum in 10 years, are always free. And I try and, and group them into like in the zone, uh, time travel, and time travel revisited, I just did, uh, and the war themes, and the boxing themes. So tonight I want to give you a little, you know, glimpse of personal photos that we have in the archive and uh, let you see some of him growing up. Uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll like seeing some of these things. And then uh, I'll come back up and talk for a few minutes if you have a QA. and a And, you know, he had a very amazing career. I mean, you, you just can't realize the number of scripts that he put out in his short lifespan. Over 252 produced works, not just written works. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the, one of the last scripts he wrote that was never made for the theaters. About three weeks before he died, he finished it, and you're going to, it's going to blow you away. So let me go back and uh, welcome, enjoy the show, and we'll click through. There's about 40, 45 pictures. Then we'll come up and talk for a few minutes. Then we're going to show you three unusual films. Rod was still in college in 1950 at Antioch College. He graduated in 50, but they, uh, the first thing he ever had aired on television, we we're going to show you tonight, it's called Christmas for Sweeney. And it's a, it's a cute, schmaltzy Christmas show. Uh, and just remember, it's 1950. A matter of fact, when I found the print at one of our film conventions back around 78, Carol Cerrone says, well, I don't remember Rod writing that. And I said, well, I'll send it to you. And she says, oh, this is so bad. Don't you dare show it. And I says, you can't tell me what I'm going to show. And I showed it at our festival many times. And the people love it because it's early vintage Serling that you don't find anywhere. The next piece I'm going to show you is from uh, a show in the mid-60s that the Christophers put out called Crossroads, and it was always religious dramas. Well, this is a very heavy, heavy, thrilling piece about bigotry and hatred with the, the Nazis and the Jewish people. And it, it's, it's sort of blow away. It's called Insight. And I was lucky because in 87, I called the company that made them. He says, we got the negatives, as you'll pay. So they charged us $270 and struck us a brand new print off the negatives. So it's a real rarity. Although it's out on video and some DVD, some people are cranking it out, but you know, someone gets a hold of it. And then the last thing is just a 10 minute promo from the Night Gallery that's not even on the DVD box set. So you'll get a little variety of some of the different things he wrote, but I'll touch briefly when we talk after the, uh, the, the pictures on a little bit of his war career. He was a war hero, not just in the war. And uh, you know, a little bit about censorship and some of the things that he wrote that have not been produced but are in the works right now. So thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the program.
museum and give me some more information. And the gentleman to the left was uh, Jack Levine, who later became a uh, big surgeon in Binghamton. And uh, the girl in the middle was a Dorothy Levine from Syracuse. And Rob Serling had ran into problems. His first uh, problems with uh, you know, bigotry and things like that was in high school because Rob dated every girl in high school. And he, they weren't Jewish, and the Jewish society threw him out and would not have anything to do with Rob because he was Jewish and dating non-Jewish girls. Well, this Dorothy Levine, a uh, couple of the boys would drive to Syracuse one week for dates and the, strand, the next week for dates, and this young girl passed away about a week after this photo. I don't know what happened. I haven't been able to track it down. Uh, this is when he was at the Panorama, was the uh, school newspaper and yearbook. Rob Serling, after a year, became the editor. It's, it's interesting. It looks like a smoke-filled room to me. <laughs> he went in school. And here we go, you know. Uh, Rob graduated January 15th of 1943, and the very next morning at 8 o'clock, right and center, and him and four friends went and joined the Army. Uh, as editor of the paper every week, he was writing articles on do your part for the war, uh, you know, whether you, you know, support it, you know, however you can financially or dra get drafted or go. And, uh, you know, he's even bugging his teachers to really get involved with the war. Of course, he wanted to go to Europe to fight against the Nazi party, but he ended up being shipped out to the Philippines. And, uh, but that's him in basic training, so that's in 43. And the buttons here. Uh oh, for some reason my thing froze. I hit a wrong button. Yeah. Bear with me just a second. We brought a laser pointer thing to, to click it, and it's not working. So I have to do it by hand, and I think I just hit the wrong button. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I'll keep my finger on the button. Uh, this is the last photo, the last time Rod Serling saw his father. It was in 1944, right before he shipped out. And uh, right near the end of the war, his father passed away of a heart attack suddenly. And Rod was devastated. He was very close to his family. He had tons of letters handwritten back and forth between his father, his mother, and himself in the military. And thank God that uh, Aunt Serling, the youngest daughter, still has all those original letters. And uh, they're, they're very touching. But he was devastated. The war was over. He was now in Japan. They still would not let him come home for the funeral, which is customary. Even today, they don't you know, allow that. And uh, here he is in Japan. There was an interesting caption written in Rod's handwriting on the back that says, you know, what the hell am I doing here and why am I here? And then this one was taken the same day. It was in November of 40, I think it was 45. And the military police, and they were called the Capitati, and in his writing he put in parentheses, Jap police, which I know isn't politically correct. And then he wrote, the guy on my right wants a reward. <laughs> Can't date this photo. I actually snagged this off the internet about a week ago. And uh, so I'm thinking it was out while well, he was out in Ohio in Antioch. It's not the greatest photo, but it's, it's a nice one. Can anybody ID the year of the card? That might help us. No. I'm not a car buff. All right, here he is. He went to Antioch College, because that's where Robert had gone. And uh, he was given his free college to the GI Bill uh, and, and disability as well. And that's where he met his wife, Carol Kramer. And uh, they were married July 31st of 49. But uh, here they were in the radio room. Now, Ron Serling first went there to become a gym teacher, uh, gymnastics and teaching, things like that. And he soon got into the theater guild and uh, started doing radio. Well, within a year, he ran the radio station completely. A matter of fact, every week, not only did he write the radio broadcast, he produced it, he directed it, he did all the music for it, the cue, he did everything. And he did a show a week for the whole year of 48 to 49. So that's the earliest photo we have of him and Carol Serling uh, together at that point. This photo is dated 1960, Indiana. Uh, must have been a trip, I don't know. <laughs> or 1950, excuse me, yes. Uh, can't tell too much about it other than that. And this is, uh, they moved after he graduated to Cincinnati, and he worked at WLW radio and uh, television station out there. And he had submitted 42 different television strips 
between 1949 and 52, and they were all rejected, other than the one that you're going to see tonight from 1950. The reason that got picked up is somehow the actor from King Kong, Bruce Cabot, got wind of this script, and he bought it from Rod for $50. And he wrote Rod Serling a check, and one of his buddies that lived across the hall, you know, the families that come in, and he showed him the check, he says, you have a cash or you keep it for the autograph? He says, you can watch him bank with me in the morning. <laughs> so uh, that's how it happened. Finally, he, he broke through in 52, and he wrote like 28 strips for a local series broadcast live called The Storm. But here he is with daughters, Ann and Jody. And this is the first of his boats on Cayuga Lake. Uh, Carol Serling's family, the grandparents, had a, a cottage out there that they kept expanding to on in, uh, Cayuga Lake and in, in Interlake in New York outside of Ithaca. And so this was named after his daughter, Joe Dash Nan, N-A-N. He called her Nan instead of uh, Jody. And here again, another picture we can't get an exact year on, but I think it fits right in this the same era. <coughs> And I love the, the face he made on this one. This was on another boat uh, called the Carolyn II, so after his wife. Uh, this is about 1958 when they came to Binghamton for a uh, high school reunion. Here they are in 59 on their way to the Emmys. By this point, Rod Serling had won three Emmys already. His first Emmy was 1955 for Craft Theater Patterns. His second Emmy was 1956 for Requiem for a Heavyweight, the classic boxing program with Jack Palance, Ed and Keenan Wynn. And then again, in 58 or 9, he won for his adaptation of The Comedian that was written for Mickey Rooney. This is in Binghamton in 1959. He was brought in to crown the beauty queen for the dedication of a rebuilt airport. Another shot on the boat, at least. More pleasant smile, I must say. <laughs> a more fun time than the last photo. Here he is, I always say, trying to water ski like he fell, but he was probably just getting ready to get up on the skis. Very athletic, he was into a lot of sports. He was almost a professional uh, tennis player and ping pong player. Uh, he tried out for the football team, he was too short, played a little baseball in school, and he won a letter in track. Now here's his teacher, Helen Foley. Uh, Rod popped in in 1961 and visited her and the students in the classroom. We have several photos, but I just put one up there. And here again, about the same era, 62, is Brown with the two daughters. I love this shot. I just found this one for the first time on the internet recently, of Twilight Zone days pulling into MGM where the Twilight Zones were filmed. It's just a wonderful shot looking back at us. Here's Binghamton Airport getting off the plane uh, where some people spotted him. He signed autographs. He loved recognition. He loved signing autographs. And here's a layer, year or two later, uh, you know, probably leaving L.A. And uh, when they flew into Binghamton, they only missed two summers when each of the girls were born. Otherwise, they spent all of their summers in, in the Ithaca area, in her lake, and in the cottage. One of the stories was so funny in Ann Serling's book, if you're not familiar. It came out about three years ago. My dad, as I knew him, Rod Serling. And she told how they had pet rats. And the girl says, well, you're not just bringing the dogs, you're bringing the rats. So on the airplane, one of the rats got out of the cage, and nobody knew it, and Rod's on his hands and knees going up and down the aisles, and nobody knew what he was doing, and finally when he said, I'm looking for my pet rat, they all went nuts. <laughs> Another shot in Binghamton around 1962 or three. Uh, Rod was interesting. Whenever he was asked by anybody to come to Binghamton and speak for any cause, he did it all at his own expense, always his own expense. So we're very grateful. In 1964, CBS did a, uh, a special on Rod's paratrooper days, and there's two shots of him in uniform recreating his parachute uh, training, parachute jumping. There's one in the plane. This Rod came into Binghamton uh, November for the Pearl Harbor reunion of local uh, and Pearl Harbor people. These are real tiny, but I pull them because they're from his Ithaca years. Uh, he moved back to <coughs> Ithaca, to Interlaken, and uh, took a professorship in 1965 and, and taught off and on there in the Cornell until his death in 75. And uh, there's just three shots, small ones of him and a couple of students. I'm hoping we can track them down through Ithaca College and maybe get some prints, but 
These are things I had never seen in 40 some years of doing my research. Here he is in 1968, Binghamton High School, he was the commencement speaker. We have a transcript from uh, the speech and he was very outspoken about all war because of the horrors of war he went through, but he was especially vehement against Vietnam and even in the transcript, the last pages, you know, talking about whether you're for it, against it, whatever, do your part and you do what your, your mind tells you you need to do. Um, here he is when I met him in 1971, Groom Community College, now called SUNY Groom, and uh, I caught him on the steps of the library at 20 to 7 in the morning, he came walking up, and they weren't open until 7, so I said, Mr. Sterling, they're not open yet, and he stood there the 20 minutes on the steps and talked with me, and it was interesting, because I didn't pay any attention to how short he was from television, but being so short, and I was sitting like on the third step, he walked up two steps so that we were eye to eye. He did not like to be looked down upon. And he had his usual suit, his hands clasped in you know, front of his waist, just like in the Twilight Zone, other than when there was a cigarette in his hand, which was quite often. He smoked five packs a day, and that, you know, I'm sure helped to shorten his life. This, I had to look up the yearbook for this girl that's to his left, because I directed and starred in Arms of the Man, George Bernard Shaw, and she was in there, and there was a scene where I was supposed to, you know, rough her up a little bit while I threw her too hard, and she went across the stage and broke her arm. Oh. But I got, she said it was worth it, I got an A for it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was quite, he loved just sitting and visiting with the people. This was in the cafeteria. He did speak on the war, and uh, the next couple are from set up. Oh, this is an interesting one from, uh, later in May of 71. You can't see in the background, but Johnny Hart, the cartoonist from BC and the Wizard of Id is to, right, to Rod's left, and then his partner, Johnny Hart's partner, Brant Parker, who did the Wizard of Id. So that was the three of them, they were buddies. And uh, Johnny Hart just passed away, not two of the years ago, of a heart attack while doing the comic strip. And what's interesting is his partner, Brant Parker, died seven days later of a heart attack. Um, now these are 73 of Rod, we had a lot of shots, I just put one in. I, you know, so many of them had this, you know, f figures to his nose or his figures to his cheek and stuff. There, just some cute poses. And here's the last speaking engagement in '73, uh, Abram Community College. And he came in. Uh, I have a recording of Helen Foley and said, "You're going to this. This is an anti-war rally, and I want you there." And so the whole speech was nothing about anti-Vietnam. And uh, I've talked to a lot of people that were there. This was the last photo I was telling you about taken uh, in the end of May, and he died June 28th. And uh, three of them, it listed the name of the professional photographer in the back. It was his, uh, at his cottage right before the second heart attack. And that's definitely not a cigarette. Uh -huh. so I had the picture on the wall at the museum for six months, and everybody would lean and say, he's smoking a joint. <laughs> it was really funny, but I took it down. But Because, you know, he was asked about 19, 70 if he'd ever smoked marijuana or used drugs. And he said, no, I haven't, but he said, it hasn't yet been proved whether marijuana is harmful to the body in any way. And he was in such pain from the heart attack. You know, I don't criticize anybody for having to smoke if that's what they wanted to do. But we get a kick. We have the original uh, photographs from the uh, person that took them. Now, I mentioned the Cooper Meat Market. This is uh, when his father, Sam, opened the first store on Court Street in Binghamton. It's now a, a bar and pub, quite a nice place, and we sent people there on our tour map. And you can see Serling Sanitary Market. And uh, it's interesting, this is a Christmas flyer, and being Jewish, the father really catered to the Christmas crowd. It's all about Christmas specials and <laughs> different things. This is an interesting piece. In the high school, in 1943, before graduation, Rod Serling painted his name in white paint in the year 1943, and the girl Jojo Handy, uh, who's <laughs> since passed, <coughs> Excuse me. When they tore down some of the stage there, they threw this in the garbage. And the gentleman holding that, I wish it showed him, he was a, a, one of the people responsible for getting the Sterling Foundation going. His name was Jules Levitt. He tracked down where this ended up and he paid the guy $100 for it and donated it back to the high school. So it's on display in Binghamton High School right now. And Jules passed away a year ago. He was a big part of this, the Sterling Foundation. We're very fortunate to have, this is from Requiem for a Heavyweight, and these are the artist set design sketches. We have all 10 that storyboards the entire Requiem for a Heavyweight, 
It's the only set in the world, we're told. And uh, this is the opening scene. You can even see the uh, boxing and wrestling posters on the wall. So when I first got this 710 in, I watched it with the play, and they just go back and forth and do store, uh, cover the whole storyboard. We also have the four foot square from the ceiling, bird's eye of the whole sets for Requiem, even the outside sets. Rod Serling always wanted to be an actor. He did do a Jack Benny show. He did do a 1962 Robert Serling, Robert Sterling starred in a sitcom, uh, Ichabod and Me, and Rod played the celebrity writer next door. And this was the last thing he acted in was Ironside, season nine, mm -hmm. called Bubble, Bubble, Toil, and Murder, where he played a warlock selling witches' brews. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only about a three minute part. This is one of the buttons I made. He had his famous quote, everybody has to have his hometown, Bankington's mine. And I made those for the first film festival we did in 87. And here we have Martin Graham's amazing book, uh, the definitive book on the Twilight Zone, over 800 pages. I think it's about five years now. Martin sold out in here, but you, if you don't have it, it's a must-buy. You can order from, <coughs> from Amazon, and uh, it's just a wealth of information. I've even learned some things when the book came out that I had not known yet. He did impeccable research, and here's a picture of Martin. I wanted to put him up. He's the one filming this for Facebook as we speak. So that's it for the film presentation. I'll come back up front now. On. Uh, there's two updates I want to give to everybody. Carol Serling has been shopping around the life story of Rod Serling since I did the Hollywood star with her back in October of 88. Well, three weeks ago, they ju she just sold the rights to a theatrical motion picture on the life story of Rod Serling. She is producer along with the, I forgot the gentleman's name, but he wrote the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, and he just finished directing his first picture with, uh, oh, Excuse me, I can't think of the name all of a sudden. So it's in the works. She's been shopping this around for a long time. Also, for the last three years, Leonardo DiCaprio, if you do some searching on Google searches, has been shopping around Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, he wants to star in it in one episode, going back in time for 80 years. They've approached J.J. Abrams. Negotiations are being made. And how many people here know the name? It's either Michael J. Straczynski or J. Michael Straczynski. Babylon 5? Yes. yes. Okay, he wrote them, directed them. Uh, he did, about eight years ago, eight Twilight Zone comic books from original Rod Serling scripts that CBS and Carol Serling allowed him to use. None of the 92 comics that came out during the Twilight Zone era uh, had anything to do with any episodes. These are his famous episodes, Walking Distance, uh, Monsters Are Do on Maple Street. They're, they're out, they're graphic. Uh, animation of like cartoons of the last eight years for the comic. Also, he is in production right now as we speak for the New Night Gallery miniseries. So there's a lot of sewing projects going on. Uh, the last thing they found in Rob's typewriter when he passed away was a completed script for the stops along the way, and that is being produced as a five-part miniseries. So all of these years after Rob's passing, uh, June 28th of 1975. He's alive and well. His legacy is continuing thanks to folks like you that are willing to sit and listen, learn something new, see something rare that he wrote uh, that you're not familiar with. So I'm going to go on back, so I'll be back at the end of this nine-minute promo, and I've got some handouts for you. Thank you. Each captures on a canvas. 
reflected that no one ever died of laughter. Pure enjoyment and edification, part of a collection of cookery unique to this special exhibit. my children in the future, I want you to read this and learn the horrors of war from me. And it was called First Squad, First Platoon, and it went into detail about his five buddies and their deaths. 
and, and all the horrors that Rod went through. The Serling family did not even know this existed, and they've since been given a copy, and uh, we're getting a copy of the, the transcript really soon, so we're looking forward to having that in our possession. But he, he said, if I have any children, I want them to hear about it from me. And the guy that saved his life shooting over his, so his shoulder, he and Rod made a pact on Christmas Day that year that if we're alive in 50 years, we're going to meet at my cottage in Interlaken. And of course, Rod wasn't, but the guy kept that promise and came and spent the day with Ann Serling and the daughters. And they read the letters and reminisced, and I thought that was a wonderful touch to uh, have remembered that pact that they had made. So, you know, Rod Serling went on with the professorship. Uh, one thing that we've read in a lot of letters and things is the students loved Rod, and, and they'd tear him apart. He'd teach a film course, and he'd show something he wrote, and he said they'd rip me a new one. He said, you know, they really tore into it and were really good judges and cr critics and things. And uh, he would have four or five out to the home almost every day out to the cottage and, and just do the same thing, visiting and talking. So he was really well liked by all the students at Ithaca. And, uh, you know, at that point he wanted to really become a major screenwriter for the theaters, not just television. He had a burning ambition to be a famous screenwriter, and he never achieved that. Uh, even though he did the adaptations for Seven Days in May and he wrote The Man about the first black president, and that he never achieved, he never had that big hit enough to really push him over. And of course, Patterns was done in 55 as a movie, and Requiem in 56 became a movie with Mickey Rooney and Anthony Quinn in 62. But even that didn't do the business and things like the TV live productions did. I thought they were a lot weaker. So, you know, we have all of these things, we show them often. I do a program in the zone every few months right now. And uh, so, how many here, by show of hands, are familiar with Rod Serling's series that followed the Twilight Zone called The Loner, Civil War Western? Any of you familiar with it? Well, it's no wonder, because he proposed it to CBS in 63 when he knew Twilight Zone was going to be on its way out soon. It's a one-hour Western. And they said no, but when he was on Hong Kong on business, they called him and said, we want to do The Loner, it's a half-hour Western. And uh, <laughs> so he flew back and they started production. Well, he hired a good friend of mine, Lloyd Bridges, who was one of my best friends, and he hired Lloyd to star as the uh, main character of the Loner series. So it ended with the, the last hour of the Civil War, and the uh, Lloyd Bridges you know, runs through a 14-year-old kid and kills him, and then the war has ended, and he says, well, if it was 10 minutes ago, you know, it would be, you know, it, now it would be murdered, like 10 minutes later. So it haunted him so bad, he's now searching the country to find himself. Well, CBS thought they hired a shoot 'em up Western. But of course, that's not Rod, what Rod ever presented or intended to do. So the stories are amazing. Some of them were really critically acclaimed. And uh, they shot 13 and filmed them. And they came to Rod Serling and said, you've got to start writing more action and violence for us. We need more shoot 'em ups. And he says, you want more of that? Write it yourself. Although he said, write the damn thing yourself. So he started slowing down and the producer started writing a few. And it, the box set was just released on DVD two months ago. Now, they've been very rare, and I've had some on film since 1977. And uh, I had 22 of the 26 that were finally filmed. It was canceled after the second set of 13. So instead of 39, there's 26 episodes. Well, what's interesting about the series is... Uh, of the four that I was missing until this box set, one was written by Rod called The Sheriff of Fetterman's County. Now, Rod Serling was not good writing a comedy. He had done a live show, a baseball episode live in 52 or 3 that absolutely bombed. And he says, I'll never write for live television a comedy again. And of course, you jump to the Twilight Zone, you had the Carol Burnett episode, you had the... Uh, uh, Andy Devine episode. So he had a few comedy episodes, and again, they just they just weren't up to par. What I didn't know is this missing loner was one of the best comedy things I've ever seen in my life. How many remember Hello Mother, Hello Father? Okay, Alan Sherman. He stars in this is the sheriff. And the music for the loner, the theme song in several episodes was written by Jerry Goldsmith. High Noon. So there's a seven minute parody of High Noon at the end of this with Lloyd and Alan Sherman using all the original music. 
I laughed out loud for an hour and I watched it three times back to back. <laughs> it just struck me so funny. So if, you know, the box set is out there, Walmart carries it. Uh, for the first month it was Walmart exclusive only. And now it can be bought on Amazon and on eBay fairly reasonable. If you like Rod Serling works, you must see it. Many of them are like the Twilight Zones. They're just, they're dramas. They're, they're totally, uh, to you know, not, not like a Twilight Zone with a twist ending, but, you know, heavy dramas. I mean, for one example, uh, the black actor, his name escapes me, uh, was coming home from the war to see his father, and he saves Lloyd's life, and when they get to town, his father's hanging in the tree. They murdered him the night before. And I'll tell you, powerful stuff. And uh, that received really amazing critical reviews. Uh, they just loved it. And uh, so it's a, it's a series that's well worth seeing. You can get it for like $18, and I really recommended it. I wanted to show you something tonight. It took me 40 some years to find. It's a nine minute pilot promo that they said never existed. And I got it out of CBS. And so I have it on DVD, but we decided right now, since we're the only place in the world you can see it, not to show it. And uh, it's not on the box set, and CBS does not have it anymore. So I was thrilled that they didn't find another print and put it up there. But what was unique about it is Rod Serling comes out on the Western set and he says, my name is Rod Serling, and I'm the reject from the Twilight Zone. And it's just funny. And they did uh, scenes for the pilot and for one other episode, and the cast is totally different other than Lloyd Bridges. And the scenes are work differently with different dialogue and I actually like what's in the nine minute better than I do what actually is. But uh, what happened, the reason it was killed after 26 weeks is this Andy White, the head producer, that was bugging Rod about writing more action, came to the set, Lloyd Bridges told me this over dinner one day, he says, well, we had the 26 episodes in the can and they weren't really sure if they were gonna renew it, but they got into a fight and Rod knocked them out cold right on the set. And that night he went home and they canceled the show that night. <laughs> so I think there's a little validity to, to what Lloyd told me. But, uh, you know, they had a great respect for one another. They both had great track records, Rod with his writing, Lloyd Bridges with Sea Hunt. And uh, it's just a wonderful series and I really recommend it. I told you a little teaser of one of the last things that Rod wrote. Because he wanted so desperately to become a major motion screenwriter, there's a new book <laughs> that's coming out very shortly. Uh, it's a thousand pages, and it's called Rod Serling, Dimensions of Imagination, The Complete Rod Serling Companion. So not just Twilight Zone, but everything he ever did. And it's the first book endorsed by any of the Serlings, and Anne Serling herself is offered to print it under a Rod Serling book company that's out there now, but he's shopping it around for a bigger publisher for a little while. But he came across a script that the Serlings didn't even know about, how many people liked the episode of Bill Mooney, It's a Great Life, where he'd wish you into the cornfield? Well, the last script that he Rod finished in May of 75, the last draft that was there, was a theatrical version of It's a Great Life. But it was starting with the birth of little Anthony, not when he's eight or nine years old. And he's born with white hair and fangs and teeth. And the very first day he kills, in the script, he kills his uncle. A few days later, he kills a policeman. He cuts his legs off. It went into really major graphic violence. I did not know Rod Serling had him in that, had that in him to write anything like that. But had he lived, I think he could have made a career really starting the graphic, the horror type of uh, material that came out shortly after. And I don't know the ending. Nick offered to tell it to me, and I said, no, I want to read it in the book. Don't surprise the ending. But uh, there was one scene he said where his mother dragged him to church as a little boy. And he hated, he says, well, this big fat slob of an organist was playing music I don't like. And he says, I created this giant rat and put it on the organ. And he says, if you don't play the music I want, my rat's going to eat you. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just tongue in cheek, but really graphic violence. So I'm hoping get, once the book comes out, Nick is going to donate scripts and some more things we don't have. We are fortunate enough to have in our uh, uh, collection some live radio shows that Rod did. Even in Antioch days, he took a uh, internship in New York City in 1946, and he acted in a series of 90-minute uh, plays, but it was only like 20 minutes. He played a juvenile that beat up a sailor or stole a bicycle or a radio, and then the rest of it was 
like talking before the judges, what do we do with this kid, and how do we help him, and how do we, how do we sentence him. But we have five episodes of those, live listening to Rod Serling, 21, playing 14-year-olds, acting in them. And we also lucked out into a couple of episodes that Rod wrote that were broadcast live in 1951, the human comedy. And uh, that's just some amazing footage. So he wrote, you know, tons of stuff for radio. A matter of fact, if you're not familiar, while he was a student in uh, Antioch in radio, he submitted a script. How many people remember the Dr. Christian show, radio show? But well, Dr. Christian, for several years, had a contest where they would uh, solicit scripts from new writers, and they would average about 3,000 a year. Well, in that year, I think it was 48, <coughs> Rod Serling and Earl Hamner Jr. both won. Uh, they both got trips for them and their wives to New York. They both got $500. They were interviewed live by Dr. Christian himself uh, on, on the show, and then their scripts were produced and aired a few months later. So Earl Hamner Jr., by the way, had written many Twilight Zones, if you're familiar with them, but he also had won that award two years prior. So he was quite a, quite a writer even in the young days with Ryan. So, you know, I tried to touch on a lot of things that you, you didn't probably know before. What do we have for questions? Anybody have any specific questions? If they're Twilight Zone related and I can't answer them, I'll pu push them off onto Martin with his book. <laughs> yes? I'm just wondering if you had any opinion about one step beyond the TV show. I haven't met, you know, a lot of people thought he might have been involved with it, which he wasn't. Uh, and I've, I've been asked that before. I've never tracked down in all my research where he's made any comment, other than no, I wasn't part of the series. And it's funny, because a lot of people think he was associated with Hitchcock, too. And his show followed the Hitchcock half hours. And uh, <laughs> there was definitely no tie in there either. Yes, way in the back. Would you give us a brief history of Rod's return to radio with Zero Hour? Yeah, the Zero Hour series, he was hired near the end of his life uh, to do the, uh, about like every five minutes, the intros and exits in between the commercial breaks and stuff. And uh, there must be, what, 180 of them or so? There's a lot of them. You're the expert on, on radio, so you might know. But, uh, you know, he had no you know real writing or anything. He was like a host that would just uh, show or do the speaking parts for intros and exits. I bought them to listen to something. You know, I'm not going to sit there and listen to them all because there's very little Sterling involvement. But I'm glad you brought that up because let's touch briefly on Night Gallery. Now, Night Gallery, actually, the person that uh, that conned or talked uh, him into writing the Night Gallery was Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy Davis had read Rod's book on Witches and Warlocks. There were three stories in there which became the pilot movie for Night Gallery. So the book is dedicated to Sammy Davis. And Rod Serling envisioned it as Rod Serling's house of wax. And he would come out and unveil a wax statue, but it turned into the paintings that he they would unveil and, and work with. And they made it clear when they hired him that it was going to be called Rod Serling's Night Gallery, but you're going to be the host and, and narrator, narrator a little bit. But beyond that, you're not going to have any control whatsoever. The young producer, Jack Laird, they had a real hate relationship. And so Rod was in instructed he had to write most of the first season the first season was only six weeks so he did write i believe nine of the segments if you remember them some had two or three segments uh some had four or five but some were really short and uh, for season two he ended up writing 20 segments but by season three jeff Lair said don't even submit another script i'm not going to read them i'll throw them in the garbage but rod did manage to get nine segments done and there was a total of 39 out of 90 uh, or 90 or 90 some that Rod had written. So he wasn't too happy with the way Night Gallery went. He hated all those little one minute uh, comedy sketches that Jack Laird was in himself, the Draculas and the Hunchbacks and those. I think they're really funny, I think they're cute. But Rod really, because he had no control over the show. Whereas Twilight Zone, he owned, he and his wife together owned 50% and CBS owned 50%. So he had a lot of control. Uh, he wrote specific episodes for specific people he hired. Uh, he, he did some amazing, amazing things, you know, and he had complete control. And uh, But he had no control on the Night Gallery series. So I have him about 20 minutes on the Dick Cavett show. We have a, a copy of his segment talking about the man and that. And when Night Gallery's brought up, he wasn't too happy about it. Even when I talked to him in 71, uh, that would have been second season, you know, he, he was, you know, it's okay, you know. So, but... There's an episode, two episodes, one critical acclaim that Rod wrote for Night Gallery. 
They're tearing down Tim Riley's bar, another hometown episode going back to your hometown roots. It's about the tearing down of the Arlington Hotel in Binghamton, New York. Uh, when I was a student for three years, in like 12, 13, and 14, he was a radio actor and announcer at our local station, WINR, which was in the Arlington Hotel. And then, as he grew up, he was in the bars all the time. Every time he came to town, he frequented there, stayed there. Mom and Dad stayed there when they moved to Binghamton. And so when he got when they were tearing it down, people even begged him to buy the darn place, you know. But, you know, he just wasn't in a position to do that. But uh, that episode is also unique, uh, starring William Wyndham, because it mentions his home address in Binghamton for the main house of all those years, 67 Bennett Avenue. It mentions his friend, Jack Levine, that I showed you in the picture, that became a doctor. Uh, the doctor, uh, no, that's in the Messiah Mont Street. The doctor with Edward G. Robinson is Dr. Jack Levine. Uh, he put in some friends of mine, the McNulty sisters, in Tim Riley's bar. So he, he was good at not only putting his wife, named Carol, and Ann and Jody in a lot of Twilight Zones and films, but he put in a lot of his friends' names, too. Any other questions? Yes, up here. You, you mentioned about he had more control of Twilight Zone. The, the opening is so iconic, all those images. Uh, did, was he, how specifically involved was he in that opening credit scene? Did he design it? What, did he suggest it? Or did he have well, I don't think he had anything to do with the, the graphics and the designs. I've read some about the person that uh, actually did the layout for the titles and things. But, uh, and nor did he have anything to do with the music. But when it came to actual production values, Martin can tell you more than I, that he had his hands on everything. As a matter of fact, we just got a still recently of a, a publicity still from Eye of the Beholder with a, her and Donald Douglas and the mask coming off. And Rod is seen adjusting the mask on, on the lady in the bed. And, you know, that's an interesting story because I don't remember her name, but if you have the DVD box set, the lady that was hired to play that part, and she's interviewed herself and they said right as they got ready to shoot, you're too ugly to do this part. You can't do it. So they brought in Donald Douglas. But they said, we'll let you be wrapped up like the mummy in bed through the whole episode, and then when we unwrap it, you'll be done in Douglas. And the lady told that herself, and I, I'm, I swear she said, they said, you're too ugly to do, <laughs> do this part. But it shows Rod on the set adjusting the, the, got the bandages and stuff. I mean, he, he was meticulous for detail. And uh, Martin's book explains something that, you know, that I did not know on the, uh, the, the Mighty Casey, the baseball episode. Uh, where it had been filmed with Paul Douglas first from Angels in the Outfield, and that he was literally dying of heart attacks on the set, uh, died right a day or two after, wasn't it, Martin? After the production, and there's even a blooper in there where you can see the back of him with his outfit as he's heading off the set, and, and the other gentleman on, on the set at the same time. And then the other side note is Robert Sorrells uh, is in prison for murder, and uh, he played the robot baseball player, and he still signs for everybody, but he's not allowed to stock photos or anything. But you are allowed to send into the prison uh, things to get signed, and he sends them back out. A matter of fact, he just uses credit card and paid for a membership at the Rod Sterling Foundation for a year. So, <laughs> and Anne Francis did that too right before she passed away. And uh, so even though I'm not familiar, you know, involved with the foundation, there's a little rivalry growing because I was so involved nine years with one, ten years with here. We're hoping eventually to merge into one. You know, we all want the same thing, to preserve the legacy of Rod Serling. More questions? I saw more hands. Well, yes. I was just, to follow up on Night Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the elements of dissatisfaction uh, that he had with Night Gallery that uh, the segments often seemed disjointed. It seemed as if material was cut, uh, at, at least or edited out of the uh, whatever was shot. And many of the episodes are uneven. Uh, did he yeah. express any concern about that? Not too much, but I do remember when the box sets came out that there's one or two episodes that are missing two or three minutes here and there. And I think they've been restored and put back in, if I remember right. So there was some of that that's going on. And uh, uh, yeah, some do seem very disjointed. And uh, you know, I'm not into the horror, horror ones, more or less. Uh, but, uh, but I have watched them all, and the other classic one that er, got great reviews was Messiah on Mott Street with Edward G. Robinson. Yeah. Edward G. is one of my favorite actors, and there's an interesting story about him too, but to get down to the show, Rod Serling being Jewish had to convert to Unitarianism to marry Carol Serling. So this was done in college. And yet everything Rod wrote that had a Christmas theme 
It was never Jewish, you know, obviously, but it was very fundamental. A lot of the scripts said, you must be born again, you must have Jesus as your say. And coming from Rod Serling's pen, I thought that very interesting too. And uh, so the Messiah on Maastricht, you've got the Jewish character, and the little boy has to go out to find the rabbi. Uh, and uh, they said that God is going to be out on the streets. You don't recognize him, tall and black. It's a style, of course, it's the Yafa Koto, the big black gentleman. And so it had elements of Judaism and Christianity. And it's just a wonderful, I love Christmas anything, but it's a wonderful story. <coughs> and uh, I really enjoy it. Just a one minute kickoff on Ryan Edward G, because you're all film fans or you wouldn't be here. Edward G. Robinson's first acting performance, according to his autobiography, which I have, uh, first few pages in, says, the first time I ever appeared on stage was at the Capitol Theater in Binghamton, New York. It's also the first time I ever had sex, and it was such a bad experience, I decided to give it up for life. <laughs> so, if you can picture Edward G. saying that, that's in his own autobiography. I saw some more hands. Uh, yes, ma'am. I grew up in and taught that Rod Serling went to Nottingham High School, which at that point was located on Fellows Ave. And he drew? Can't be, because he moved to Binghamton when he was about a week after one That's year old. That's what I figured, but I don't know what yeah. understand why uh, a matter of fact, I've contacted a couple of the temples there and talked to some rabbis, and I'm going to make a trip up, and they're going to show me where the grave sites are for Mom and Dad Serling. I want to get pictures. There's a lot of people. We have Rod Strape site pictures up, but they asked about you know mom and dad Serling too, and uh, brother Robert passed away. I'd say about four or five years ago. His brother Robert was also a writer, and one of his uh, the president's plane is missing. Received critical acclaim, and Rod said I wrote part of that, but I didn't get any credit for it. He didn't want to be you know involved and take any credit away from his brother Robert. But I did speak to him twice, once in '87 and once about five six years ago. It was very wonderful very supportive of what we were doing at our museum. Yes? You said you didn't think uh, that uh, Rod had anything to do with the music uh, for Twilight Zone. Does that mean that Bernard Herrmann was assigned by CBS and, and Rod didn't have any real choice in that? Uh, I've never read any. Do you know anything more about that, Mark? I don't. Um, Buck Houghton was the producer. Right. Of it. He simply hired the musicians. Yeah, I didn't think Rod had anything to do with, with bringing in musicians. Uh, although if he had a problem with something, whether it was music or whatever, he'd let you know. And he, a matter of fact, getting back to the to the baseball story, the end of the story is Rod would not. He says you can't air this. He said Paul Douglas just died. But beyond that, it's terrible. His acting was so bad. He was so sick. He was dying. He says I want to reshoot the whole thing at a cost of about fifty thousand dollars, if I believe, uh, around that from Martin's book. And uh, CBS says, no, we're not going to pay that. And Rod paid every penny himself and reshot it. Is that correct? Good, I remember something right with Mark's book. <laughs> more questions? I saw more hands. No, nope, pretty well done. Okay, we're going to queue up. 1950, Christmas for Sweeney. Uh, very fun, lighthearted, schmaltzy little Christmas story. We'll follow that with the insight. Um, Really heavy-handed piece. I think you're going to enjoy it if there's enjoyment to be found in the topic of that episode. It will end with the 10-minute Night Gallery promo that shows all the stars for the whole series that had been shot up to that point. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your, your warm welcome. And thank you for your questions. There were some good questions. Right. Uh, we put together a tour map, so if you come to Binghamton, you can go see... 17 of the Rod Serling sites. There's actually 32 I'm up to now. We're doing a booklet. So I have a tour map for everybody, and it has our Rod Serling archive uh, website address on it, as well as the Bundy Museum phone number and address. If you ever do make the trip down, call the museum, tell them you're coming in a day or two, and you'd like Mike Piper to come in. I will spend four or five hours showing you things that you can't see that aren't on display and take you on a guided tour. I do that for a lot of people. And then I also have here, I've printed out 25 or 30 real uh, photographs from, of some unusual photographs of Rod. And there's one for everybody. So I think I have enough. If you're a tour show and a family, just take one, please. It's my, it's my. Share and go through the photos and grab one. I'm so glad you were able to come in and study. Yeah, I had a convincing that I was able to do it. Okay.
Did you get a picture? No. Oh. Oh, oh that's Thanks, Mike. Yes, that was great. I'm really honored to have like eight or nine of my dealer friends I've known for years close their tables and come in. That was really a, a rare privilege for me. Inside. Yeah, the trouble. Thank you. Shall we get some scroll on there? Put this to show the thing that you No, I have to go somewhere else. Get up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. We're, the photos are around someplace. Yeah, they're back there. We're back there now. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, yep. Is there like contact form? Yes, if you go to our website, you'll also have the email Rob Serling Archive at gmail.com is on our website, which is on the front of the Okay. And I answer everybody's mic type. Is it written on the No, it's not on there, but you'll, you'll just see the email. You'll see me all through the website. A lot of photos with Hollywood stars when I did the party in Hollywood with Ron Star. And uh, so you'll see me throughout a lot of things on there. We have some really rare videos from 87 of uh, you know, me with a lot of the stars and things and uh, some fun stuff. Uh, it was fantastic. And I just want to tell you, I'm from Grace and Society. I'm vice president. I had Alex contact you guys specifically. I said you're close enough we could get some people there. You had Carol Searle, you had Ann Searle in two years ago, right? She did something. She did something at the big Toronto Film Festival. Oh, that's, she showed oh, that's you the presence different. Of we're the Toronto Film Society. We've been around since 1948. We're not that's a different uh, organization. But the reason I'm telling you is because in May we have a film festival and we're featuring Edward Jones. The only problem I have is I don't have $100 for a visa to cross the bridge. That's because my nephew has to be with me, and I just I would love to go back. I haven't been in Toronto. Or, Canada in 20 years. But, uh, if things ever change, yeah, yeah, they come down, or you know, if you'd like me to even do a program sometime, if you guys should just pay for even one of uh, my visas, and I would do the other one. And I'd love to come up. Thank you so much. Thank you. What do you think of the remasters they've been showing on uh, Sci-Fi Channel? I mean. I mean, they look, they're, now they're all looking like they're video. Oh, the, the Twilight Zones that they're yeah. redoing on Sci-Fi? Yeah, I really haven't watched them because I've seen them. Uh, yeah, I mean, they look crystal clear, better than film. But then you don't mean tape, you mean digital. Uh, <laughs> no, but it is. Game. The video tape episode of Twilight Zones. That's it. Film. Ooh. Yeah. 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 I had brought these and never had time to get them on the table. Where are the, uh, they're down here. One of his original letters to Helen Foley and some of the photos. I think most of them are on the screen. screen. Yes. This wasn't because this was uh, Planet of the Apes. I never got to talk about that. I'll do that another time. I guess they're telling us. Yeah, we're being thrown out. Well, we'll finish up with Mike. There's the Rod Sterling Archive if you're in Birmingham. Binghamton. Binghamton. He said Birmingham. Yes, he did. <laughs> Binghamton, I guess. Now, here, here it is. These, these will list all the different places that you can visit of Rod Sterling's hometown, where he lived, where he got inspiration for several of the episodes. And Mike has made an offer for to give people per, personal uh, tours and such. Uh, as you already know, it's going to be really yep. simple. There are 17 sites on here, but we actually have 32 that I'm working on a booklet format that will uh, be everything that we've located now. And it'll be like Paul Harvey. There'll be a picture before and after, and now the rest of the story. There'll be a little story of, of each one, so we're working on that. That's really and nice. We've gone through about a 1,000 flyers already, and our website is on here, rodsorlingarchive.org. And you can reach me at rodsterlingarchive at gmail.com. Good. That's very good, isn't it? So the Rod Sterling Master. So, and, uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's good to be a master at something. Yeah. I'm, I'm at a master of eating and sleeping. <laughs> I do pretty good in both of those areas, too. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's been quite a day, too. It's 1130 at night. And I, although one more, more movie is running now. Most of the people have turned and take a quick look around. There's uh, the D 
dealer's room is vacated. And seeing, uh, you know, the green but we'll be back again tomorrow, won't yep, we? Yep, see you in the morning. In the morning. Yep.